Uh, thank you all of you for coming. And, uh, uh, I'll start off with a little bit of an anecdote. About 25 years ago, maybe a little longer, I uh, attended a talk uh, by a rather uh, unusual gentleman. Uh, his name is Ruben Setliff. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Setliff uh, was an unusual character. He was a Baptist preacher along with being a general laryngologist. And he was talking about this device he had come up with called a Hummer that uh, had been purchased by his hospital for doing uh, hypermandibular arthroscopic surgery and didn't get much use for that, but uh, Dr. Setliff's idea was to use it for sinus surgery and uh, the rest is kind of history. Uh, but that talk uh, put me on a path uh, that really has uh, changed my professional career. And it's that story I'd like to tell you about tonight. Um, it's also the story about the development of an entirely new subspecialty in pediatric neurology, which is uh, pediatric sleep surgery. Uh, anyway, so that's what I'd like to tell you, that experience of that 25 years and what we've learned in the process. I have no disclosures. And I'd like to begin with both my introduction and conclusion. The equation of uh, pediatric sleep apnea is a complex one. It's made up by the age of the child, the anatomy of the child, and the physiology of the child, which includes the immune physiology of the child. So all of you have heard who have been in my clinic that obstructive sleep apnea in kids is a three-legged stool. It's based on the <coughs> symptoms of the child, the anatomy of the child, and finally the polysomnogram. Three things have to align for you to make that diagnosis properly. Based on these observations, I can tell you that there are common patterns for pediatric sleep apnea. There's children in the neonatal period, primarily Pierre Robin, laryngomalacia, uh, the separate group. There's a group of kids in the middle period from around three, maybe younger, to 10, maybe older, whose big problem is tonsils and adenoids. And there's an entire subgroup of kids who don't have tonsil adenoid problems. That's something else that resembles adult sleep apnea. And we'll talk about what our options are on these. So what I'd like to leave you with is that the primary sleep surgery in neonates is superglottoplasty for lungomalacia and mandibular distraction for Pierre Robin. And the primary goal in all of this is to avoid a tracheotomy. And I can tell you that in the last 20 years, I can count on one hand with many fingers left over how many tricks we've done for either of these two problems. Um, it used to be that the primary options for, ton for sleep surgery and with, for big tonsils and adenoids was a tonsillectomy. Well, those options have expanded. And finally, you have a secondary options for when tonsils and adenoids are no longer uh, in play and you have sleep endoscopy, lingual tonsillectomy, you've got midline glossectomy and epiglottopexy along with superglottopexy in older children. This makes up the group of uh, problems that I'll be talking about tonight. Now, sleep apnea was accepted as a childhood illness just about the time I started residency. Its prevalence is relatively low. It's around 1 to 3 percent. About 10 percent of kids will snore. Only a small percent of those will be actually sleep apnea. And the components of sleep apnea, it's not just the fragmentation of sleep, but it's also hypercarbia and hypoxia. You need to see all three to make the diagnosis. As far as symptoms are concerned, snoring, daytime sleepiness, wetting the bed, and uh, maybe if it's really severe cardiovascular problems can be an issue. Poor growth sometimes you'll see, given that uh, growth hormone secreted primarily at, uh, during sleep and you fragment the sleep, you can affect that as well. And then finally, there's this whole issue of behavioral concerns. And I can tell you that I've seen a lot of kids with sleep apnea and you know, with behavioral concerns. And I tell the parents, I can probably take care of the sleep apnea. Behavioral concerns, eh, not so much. <laughs> um, and then finally, there's the polysomnogram. Um, and uh, current definition is any, uh, sleep, any child with a apnea hypopnea index greater than one uh, is, is abnormal. Um, 
You need to see 10 second or more obstruction with arousal. And, but the other two are also important, the hypopnea, uh, dropping below 92% where the uh, oxygen saturation curve gets very steep. And uh, you want to see the uh, carbon dioxide elevated as well, indicating hypoventilation. Now, there's other issues as well. Now, you know, the airway grows with the child, but it doesn't grow linearly. And uh, there's growth of bone and there's a functional matrix, in other words, soft tissue that overlies the bone uh, that uh, is variably related over time. Um, as we learn to speak, the respiratory and swallowing physiology become increasingly complex. Also, this occurs as the larynx descends. And then, of course, the anatomy and the immune system are codependent. Um, and then finally, there's kind of a fuzzy boundary, kind of like on the top of his head, uh, <laughs> uh, of what's the difference between a kid and what's the difference between an adult. Uh, and we can have an hour-long argument about that, so we won't go there. Um, what I can show you in the anatomy is that there are some substantial changes that occur at some places we don't usually think about. But the skull, as you, when you're born, is skull base relatively flat. And then as, you, as your brain develops, it flexes. And I'll talk about a little more of that. But in the process, the nasopharynx deepens and enlarges. Just about the time when that process happens, when adenoids get big and obstruct the nasopharynx. As adults, we see much deeper nasopharynges. You don't see a lot of adenoids, but then you see problems at the level of the velum. So as the change in age occurs, we see that in infants, the larynx is very high up in the, uh, in the pharynx, and then little by little it descends. Uh, the pharynx deepens and lengthens and becomes the resonating chamber for what makes us uniquely human speech. Um, and uh, Jeff Leitman, a good friend of mine, has a wonderful theory about why we, as humans, have obstructive sleep apnea. He says, look, so if you blow through a larynx uh, de novo, what you get is essentially the sound that you get out of a, the mouthpiece of a saxophone. You need the body of the saxophone to get music. You need your pharynx to get words. You need to be, uh, your pharynx to be able to speak. And it's this long elongated meat tube that you need to speak is what causes you to have problems with sleep apnea when it collapses when you sleep. Um, now, to be able to do what the pharynx has to do, which is really highly complex if you think about it, you've got two fundamental physiologic functions, respiration, alimentation, working through the same real estate, but they're mutually exclusive. So the larynx is highly mobile, the laryngopharynx is highly mobile, and it moves up and down sideways, and uh, you know, kind of like chewing your gum and catching on your tonsil, leaving it left and right. Uh, none of you younger guys know what that from. Um, anyway, but it's suspended from superiorly in the back or from the uh, skull base, the mastoid and styloid, uh, anteriorly from the mandible, and then <coughs> inferiorly, inferiorly from your clavicles, your sternum, and posteriorly from your uh, scapula. So it allows it to move around easily, and it's the hyoid is the fulcrum. Okay, and hyoid allows, is what allows the, the, the larynx to be so mobile. The next piece of the interesting uh, part of this is is the innervation. Um, all of you know it's the vagus. That's not the part that's interesting. What's the part that's interesting, if you look in the medulla, is the amount of real estate that's devoted to this. It's huge. And it's also integrated with the respiratory system, phrenic nerve. Again, a large part of your brainstem is devoted to this one uh, nerve that allows you to have this complex, mutually exclusive, fundamental processes and allow you to do it your entire life safely. It's amazing that it does. Now, I think you get a better sense of how this works is if you look at the amount of innovation the pharynx gets. You look at the innovation of a gastrox, like the, your, your, thigh, your calf muscle, you get one nerve for about 2,000 uh, uh, muscle fibers. If you look at the eye, which I used to think was the most uh, accurately controlled system, you get one to nine, and the pharynx is one to six. An enormous amount of uh, resource devoted uh, to this site. And then, of course, you've got Walter's <coughs> ring coming into play as the child begins to uh, acquire immunity, usually begin around three months of age. 
but uh, it begins to cause problems with uh, adenoids and tonsils as the kid gets older. So how do you solve this uh, complex equation of age, anatomy, physiology, and immunology? And the best way I think about it is doing it uh, by age. So when we look at newborns, the commonest cause of neonatal stridor and neonatal sleep apnea is laryngomalacia. You have an inspiratory stridor that's high-pitched, mild to severe, and then you have problems with feeding, sleeping, agitation, and crying. Um, in our exam, we look uh, do a fiber optic uh, look at the larynx, look at the growth chart, see how the child is maintaining their weight. Uh, we do a polysomnogram, which is some of the worst sleep studies we see, and then we'll do laryngoscopy. The laryngoscopy, you see two forms. The curler form you see here, where the larynx is literally falling together superglottically uh, with a abnormally omega-shaped epiglottis. You then get the other form, which is you have normal epiglottis, but the uh, larynx collapses anterior, posterior. We call these the floppers. Uh, the treatment uh, depends upon the severity. Mild uh, disease, you observe. Uh, many, many of the kids do benefit from a little anti-reflux medication. And then finally, we do surgery for the severe kids. And the operation that we've been doing for this since the mid-80s, and it's been done with cold steel, it's been done with lasers, and it's been done with micro debriders, and all of them work. Uh, I prefer the laser, as you're seeing here. And basically, you cut the end. A area epiglottic fold, and then reduce the mucosa overlying the arytenoid. Um, and you do it on both sides and wipe away the char, which induces inflammation, and then you go to the other side, and that usually takes care of the problem. Um, the other one that we see regularly is Pierre Robin. Again, remind you, micrognathia, u shed cleft palate, and uh, glossoptosis. You can see the glossoptosis on this fibrotic exam. As we go into the child's uh, nose, you'll see the cleft palate. You'll see either side of the, uh, what should be the uvula. But as you, we pass that area, you'll see how the tongue falls against the posterior pharyngeal wall, collapsing the airway with each breath. This is glossopresis on fiber optic exam. The child does well when they're uh, crying. The uh, treatment for this has changed dramatically, whereas it used to do for the trace usually. Now it's mandibular distraction is the standard of care. Yeah. And uh, these are pictures courtesy of Pete Lorenz uh, showing the distractor in place. And this shows the CT with the uh, pre and post-op. You can see the amazing difference six weeks later after the distraction. The other area then is the kid, kids uh, who begin to get big tonsils and adenoids. Most of this is otolaryngology. Some of the earliest kids were allowed to take care of. And adenoids usually peak, uh, reach their peak around three years of age, whereas tonsils around six. And uh, they variably will obstruct the airway. Um, the recognition that adenoids were uh, causing problems is an old one. This is a photograph of a child with adenoid facies dating from 1917. Uh, he's got the classic appearance of the open mouth posture, rings around the eyes, the elongated filtrum, and uh, the kind of blank stare. Uh, we see these kids usually uh, between 18 months and three years of age. They are chronically nasally obstructed. They have mouth breathing, snoring, and restless sleeping. And they typically have a history of otitis media. When you look in the oral cavity, the tonsils are nice and small. Um, you make the diagnosis in a variety of different ways. You can do it on an x-ray, the lateral soft tissue of the neck, which is shown here on uh, the right. Uh, or you can do a fiber optic exam and see the uh, cork at the back end of the nose that's obstructing it. Now, uh, I trained using an uh, adenoid curette uh, back in the 1970s. And uh, I found this wonderful quote from 1903 in the laryngoscope. Um, uh, by uh, F.B. Eaton, dependence on the curette alone appears to be irrational. 
An instrument like Gottstein's forceps, which scrapes rather than cuts the adenoid, will not thoroughly remove it. With many operators, <laughs> there is bliss for after a hasty operation with the curette, during which the phenomenon of hemorrhage encourages them to believe they have been thorough, discover later that close to the coena, a considerable mass yet blocks the way. Um, so, yes, sometimes the adenoids work, uh, curettes worked, and sometimes you left with the linguini, other times left with uh, uh, multiple scrapes because they were dull. Uh, Ruben Setliff's idea of using microdebriders for sinus surgery uh, then gave me the idea of maybe using the microdebrider for adenoidectomy, and indeed that's the way it's been done in my hands now for uh, about 20, 25 years. And uh, this is the procedure, you do it with visualization, we don't do it by braille anymore, and uh, <laughs> you can see that it's easy to do the procedure and leave behind a little berm uh, inferiorly so you avoid velopharyngeal insufficiency. You can really do this even in kids with palatal abnormalities if you leave enough of the inferior adenoid alone. You control the bleeding with suction cautery. Other techniques exist, but uh, this was the way you know, we've been doing and you can see the suction being used. Um, and one of the few prospective randomized trials I've done um, we looked at how, whether we got a better resection, better control, satisfaction, recovery, no complication, and lo and behold, the uh, power-assisted adenoidectomy was superior. Um, now, as far as tonsillectomy is concerned, the modern tonsillectomy, as conceived uh, as what we were trained in, uh, was basically described by um, uh, Fowler, in a book published 1930, and he, his comment was, remove the whole tonsil and nothing but the tonsil. Um, this was a appropriate anatomical dissection in a normal, in a, a easily obtained uh, surgical plane between the muscle and the capsule. It was technically satisfying, it was easy to do. A complete tax, uh, tonsillectomy is also a rational procedure in the pre-antibiotic era. Um, concerning that subtotal tonsillectomy, which really has its origins in, of tonsillectomy, that the remaining uh, tonsil would re get reinfected and regrow. Uh, and indeed, this was a tonsillectomy I learned, uh, where we started with an incision superiorly uh, and then uh, used a fissure knife uh, to uh, then remove the uh, remainder of the tonsil, controlling the bleed using uh, the snare to remove the inferior pole and then using suction cautery uh, to control the bleeding. Um, about the mid 80s uh, we began using the electrocautery and this is the technique most people use today and you can see why that might be the case given that this is done in real time here and it's essentially a bloodless procedure um, and uh, this is the primary means it's done pretty much uh, in the U.S., although now coblation uh, and uh, is uh, is almost as common as well. There's one problem with tonsils: pain and bleeding, uh, uh, and these uh, remain to be solved. And many strategies have been tried, both medical and surgical. But there's no such thing as a painless tonsillectomy that never bleeds, um, and it's basically a fundamental design flaw of the operation. The pain is from the injury to an inflammation of the underlying pharyngeal muscles. I showed you how much afferents they have. Well, they have just as, I mean, efferents they have, they have just as much afferents. It's a lot of sensation in the throat. So it's the pain is from injury and inflammation of the muscle and from infection and from the exposure of those uh, from the secretions. And you don't get recovery until the remucosalization occurs. The site remains vulnerable to bleeding until the vessels heal. Um, in uh, starting around 1996, we began to use the microdebrider to do partial tonsillectomies. It was quite different than the old tonsillotomy where you took the medial portion of the tonsil. We shaved the tonsil out almost to the entire capsule and uh, taken about 90%. And multiple studies have been done on the procedure, which is demonstrated here. Uh, <coughs> microdebrider uh, and uh, you can see how readily the microdebrider 
uh, removes the uh, tonsillar tissue, and uh, the bleeding is relatively modest throughout the procedure until you get pretty close to the capsule as you get toward the larger vessels. And then you control the remaining bleeding with the suction cautery, but the suction cautery also does some of your uh, final resection and die back of the lymphoid tissue toward the capsule. So we've looked at uh, the results uh, several times now, and uh, how does the recovery compare to between a partial and a total? And there's really no comparison. The partial is just easier on the kids. Uh, when we look at uh, post-operative dehydration, the two groups are entirely different. It's the same thing uh, with bleeding. These are out of my own studies uh, at the Cleveland Clinic. What's not different is quality of life in terms of improvements in sleep. Um, many other techniques have been developed for a partial tonsillectomy. This is Kay Chang's technique of using uh, the coblator. Kay's done a lot of the original prospective randomized work on uh, intracapsular tonsillectomy using coblation, demonstrating once again reduced bleeding and uh, or post-operative hemorrhage and easier recovery. Um, just uh, this past two months, in the laryngoscope, a large uh, 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 meta-analysis of morbidity after pediatric tonsillectomy, looking at really huge numbers, 24,000 totals, 12,000 partials. I think the uh, data on post-operative bleed speaks for itself. Now, the question for us is, are they equivalent in terms of sleep surgery? And, um, and the answer is in yes or <coughs> maybe. Um, we looked at uh, our results between 2005 and 2010, where we had, uh, uh, we had post-operative polysomnogram results, and we also looked at the entire cadre for complications. And uh, uh, this was uh, published uh, several years ago in International Journal of Pediatric Laryngology. And again, the... Um, the two procedures are identical in terms of relieving obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, what's different is uh, with uh, partial tonsillectomy, we saw about a 2% regrowth rate, which is, you know, real concern, legitimate concern. On the other hand, we saw a 3% hemorrhage rate with the partial tonsillectomy group and none with the partial. So, again, you need to balance that off. Um, and why does this happen? Well, a wonderful article in... Uh, Clinical anatomy coming out of Korea in 2008 showed the difference between vessel sizes between the, um, uh, uh, the muscular bed, the capsule, and the tonsil itself. And these are the results. Again, uh, the vessel size in intracapsular is half the size in the muscle and about 50% uh, uh, smaller than at the capsule itself. So this is the reason we don't get bleeds, which is really the, most, the biggest concern we have with tonsillectomy. Um, so are they equivalent uh, for sleep apnea? Sometimes. If the tonsil is big and exophytic, like the one on the, your right, yes. When it's more endophytic, less so. Uh, if the kids have comorbidities, uh, I tend toward the total tonsil. The younger kids do better with the partial in general. The older kids tend to be more endophytic and le less responsive to the, to the partial. But each child deserves a special look and a unique look. Um, what uh, we know, though, is that about 15 to 35 percent of kids are going to fail. They're going to fail. And uh, even higher when we see comorbidities, irrespective of the technique that you use, irrespective. And again, Jenny uh, helped us put together a, a, a look at when we did uh, the kids with syndromic kids and how we did with their, them. What we found was that it was the, the surgery was less effective than less than 50% of the kids. Again, consistent with the literature, but more importantly, they were more higher in complications. So um, the, the, the important thing to remember is, again, select the, the, the child appropriately because some of the things we do to the kids are not in, entirely uh, uh, predictable. The other thing that we found um, is that obesity is a huge 
uh, factor in our failure. And I tell every parent, your kids can eat their way out of any surgical success I can achieve. Uh, and this is absolutely correct. And an interesting study uh, that Kay did with uh, uh, Joanne Chekowitz showed that when we do tonsillectomy, the kids gain weight. So especially in the obese kids, we got a huge dilemma of what to do. And uh, we can maybe have Kay talk about that a little bit after the, uh, uh, I finish the, the talk. But anyway, so that's an issue. So let's get back to tonsillectomy. Um, the first actual formal uh, referral to a total tonsillectomy is in uh, John, John Jacob Ballinger's 1908 textbook, uh, his first edition. In it he writes, after having tried almost every known method of removing the tonsils, the simplest of all instruments is the common scalpel. While every detail of in the technique is not original with me, the operation as a whole has been my own creation, especially with reference to removal of the entire tonsil with the capsule intact. So this was where what was originally at this time called a radical tonsillectomy. Um, what's interesting is illustrating his tonsillectomy which, uh, pictures I just showed you, this is the following picture. And it shows him sewing the caps the pillars together, uh, thinking that might help with the uh, with the uh, uh, with hemorrhage. It didn't, by the way, but all the studies have shown it didn't. But, Bottom line is they were already thinking of a bigger tonsillectomy. Now, um, the bigger tonsillectomy that came into practice during my uh, uh, residency, uh, toward the end of it, actually after, after my residence in 1984, was uh, UPPP. Um, and it involved doing exactly what I show on that. And that's look awful. And it felt awful to the people we did it to. But we, we had a great enthusiasm for this for a while. And then um, the uh, sleep docs came back to us and said, wait a minute, what about that 50% failure rate? And of course, the surgeon said, well, look at that 50% success rate. Yeah. Uh, bottom line is it never really took hold in pediatric otolaryngology. What did uh, take hold uh, was, if anything was done, was sewing the pillars together. Um, and that's what I did for a while, and then the, the waxing way, and it didn't make much seem to one enthusiastic for it. And then about seven, eight years ago, I saw a, uh, a talk uh, um, by one of the sleep docs at uh, UPenn and uh, describing uh, the Pang Woodson expansion for ringoplasty technique. Uh, and it's shown in my drawings here, and basically involved. Uh, removing, uh, detaching the mucosa from the palate pharyngeus after you've done your uh, tonsillectomy. You then dissect out the palate pharyngeus laterally, detach it inferiorly, put a suture through it, and then you make a tunnel uh, through the, uh, from uh, the uh, soft tissue in the palate right above the hamulus. You pull your sutures through, you put your suture around the hamulus, and uh, you get your expansion. Well, again, you know, after a while, I kept doing this, and I found that that this little bit of muscle just wasn't good, taking a whole lot of pull. It, uh, the suture often pulled out, and it ended up again once. I hate to use the term again, but a weenie. So, um, so I started uh, doing something a little different, looking for a better site and maybe a better way. They gave me the same results. So again, here's a total tonsillectomy, adenoidectomy. Um, and then what I do here is I find the fulcrum where the uh, the palatopharyngeus turns up into into the palate. Uh, you can see again my drawing demonstrates it, and here it is in the OR. Um, I then take a two a C1 needle with either a two or a three O vical suture and pick it up just inferior to the fulcrum and pass it through the palate in the entire body of the palate of pharyngeus. And there's about five millimeters of uh, tissue taken. And then bring it back through the this, uh, mattresses back through the other side of the palate of pharyngeus. You can see I pick up a fair, the size of a chunk of the muscle and then pull on it and see how well it holds. What I'm doing is lateralizing uh, the uh, the palatopharyngealis and deepening the retropalatal space. 
which is often uh, one of the sites of obstruction. Um, the question then was where to, where to put the anchor. And the tissue of the gums in the retromolar trigone is remarkably tough. Uh, all of us have done uh, maxillofacial trauma work. This is why we put in our wires. Anyway, it's good tissue, and it serves a wonderful anchor. So I pass it through up and just behind the molar. You can see it come through there. Uh, then sludge on a second needle and bring it right through the same site. Uh, and then pull it up and tie it down. This is what it looks like when it's done. Um, anyway, we've done a bunch of these now, and uh, one of these days I'll get around to maybe uh, actually looking at the numbers. But I, I like what I, I see in the clinic postoperatively on these. It works easy. The other thing is it takes five minutes, and I after uh, I think Alana did one after doing her first tonsillectomy with me, so it's technically easy. Uh, it's technically easy. Anyway, we don't ignore the other things that cause problems with sleep. Uh, and we like to polish our results. Um, when proximal nasal obstruction can result in distal obstruction and airway collapse. So we pay attention to the nose and we look at turbinates. We send a lot of kids. We have a very low threshold for getting allergy uh, uh, evals on the kids. If they have a sinus infection, we treat that. And if they have septal deviation, we note that and see if that is going to play, start playing into the problem. Um, allergic infections, uh, uh, in treating infections is important, but mostly what we have problems with is allergy. And here you see the, the turbinate, the hardly any airway around them. Here's another example, just big turbinates. And for those, we really like doing inferior turbinate cautery after trying liberal use of nasal steroids. Um, we use the Ceylon product, which seems to work very nicely and safely. And we also like doing submucous resection of the inferior turbinate again, which gives us uh, a little more space in the nose to help ventilate the rest of the pharynx. Um, the other aspect that I think is really, really important in terms of polishing our results is using orthodontia. This is applicable to a large portion of the population that you know is going to fail because of craniofacial reasons. Um, and it's uh, when these kids meet appropriate criteria with the eruption of the first molar and uh, observed palatal narrowing, you can see why it works. It does two things. Think about what floats on top of the palate. What floats on it? It's the nose. You widen the palate, you widen the nose. Simple idea. Okay? As you widen the palate, what do you widen? You have to also widen the mandible in order to maintain ortho the, your, your occlusion. So what do you do when you widen the, the mandible? You give more room for the tongue, less likely to fall back. Simple idea. It's mechanical and it works. So what do we do next? Here's a seven-year-old boy snoring, observed apnea, daytime tiredness, bedwetting. BMI is 30 plus, and he's got massive tonsils. We get a sleep study, so an apnea hypopnea index 18.2. He's got apnea, hypopnea, and O2 nadir of about 81%. Um, we uh, do a TNA, we do with pillar closure, uneventful recovery. Mother comes back a month later. He's still snoring and still falling asleep at school, and he's still wetting his bed. I get another sleep study, and his apnea hypopnea index is still severe. Uh, he only has hypo uh, hypopneas, no more apneas. His oxygen stats have come up, but not the way I'd like to see them. So, what could we do for these failures? Well, CPAP's always an option. It's effective, safe, it's less expensive than a lot of the stuff we do. It involves a lot of parental involvement, uh, and, uh, and it's a, a wonderful alternative for difficult patients. But, this is not a talk about CPAP. This is a talk about surgery, so let me move on. Um, so this has been the core idea of our work for the last pretty much 15 years. What do we do with that 15 to 25 percent failure rate? Um, are there logical sequence of uh, evaluations? And then are there rational surgical options? So starting uh, when I came here in 2004 and finding no real alternatives what to do, and having an absolute um, uh, feast of sleep studies available to me. Keep in mind, this was the place where sleep medicine begins. I did more sleep uh, studies in the first year I was here 
in the 39 years before or 29 years before. Anyway, uh, but in cards by what I read then in the literature, we began to do sleep endoscopy around 2005. I'd like to share some of those important lessons learned, how we refined our technique, and how it's really become a ubiquitous, important tool uh, in uh, sleep uh, uh, surgery today. Um, we do this in close cooperation with anesthesia. Our current cocktail then has been for the past decade using sevoflurane and ketamine, uh, and then using uh, dexamethamidine uh, as the primary agent to, kids, uh, to keep the kids asleep. Now, there's some controversy on this. The some centers will use propofol and remifentanil, um, but for the most part, I think the majority still use the, uh, our, our protocol. We'll typically prepare the nose with oxymetazoline both for, and lidocaine, both for decreased sensation and to decrease the likelihood of bleeding. Uh, nothing to, to uh, uh, screws up your sleep uh, 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 endoscopy as a bloody nose. Um, anyway, so what we're trying to do is uh, develop a classification of the, the problem, and uh, I have my own, I guess, uh, called the Legos classification, and it's based on where the obstruction is going from inferior to superior. Is it the larynx, the epiglottis, the tongue, or pharynx, or is it soft palate? And um, this demonstrates a variety of the sites of obstruction. This is a normal. And you see the little adenoid, wide open retropalatal space. Superior is the uvula. The tongue is not prolapsed. The epiglottis and larynx are wide open. You can see the presence of lingual tonsils, but they are not excessively large. That's normal. On the other hand, here's a big set of adenoids. You can just barely get through the nasopharynx. You can see the retropalatal space is also obstructed with adenoids. And then you get to the oropharynx and you got these big tonsils sucking together each time the kid takes a breath and obstructing, but the larynx isn't obstructed. And then here's a kid with small adenoids, but again, barely any retropalatal space. Modest sized tonsils. And you can see there's the Epiglottis is in a reasonable position. This one's not hard either. It's a big pair of tonsils looking at it from on top. Now, I like doing my sleep endoscopies from the position I do laryngoscopies in, uh, in the operating room. And they're all the same. Now, this is a kid with Down syndrome who's had a tonsils and adenoids out. Look what's happening. Everything is circumferential collapse. There's no surgery for this child that's going to do anything for him. This would require CPAP. And here we go in, and all of a sudden you see an abundant amount of lingual tonsillar tissue pushing on the epiglottis, pushing it down onto the posterior pharyngeal wall. As you slip under the epiglottis, you see it's more, the larynx is normal. Again, modest size adenoids, but significant. But look what happens. No lingual tonsils this time, but you've got this enormously elongated epiglottis that plops down onto the posterior pharyngeal wall each time the kid takes a breath. So what do we do with this one? We sink under the larynx and we're looking for other sources of obstruction, there is none. But you can see how that arytenoids might want to flop inward, and indeed sometimes that's exactly what you see. An interesting looking epiglottis in terms of its anatomy, but look what happens underneath. Here you see the arytenoid mucosa prolapsing into the epiglottis, and causing this the primary cause of the sleep apnea. So, anesthesia is not sleep. Oh my goodness, ah. <laughs> she just walked out. That's the picture. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, sleep endoscopy is a rough model of sleep, but nevertheless, it's enormously useful both for the diagnosis of lingual tonsillar hypertrophy, um, prolapse, and occult laryngeal malacia. Um, to emphasize this recent uh, uh, meta-analysis um, 
by Norm Friedman, I was one of the co-authors, current state of pediatric sleep uh, uh, endoscopy. Bottom line, everybody's doing this and trying to figure out how best to classify it. Lego seems reasonable to me. Anyway, so what, do we, what happens when we do sleep that uh, doesn't make a difference? But when we looked at it again, this was my T. Trong's uh, 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 study he looked at 150 kids uh, uh, over a three-year period who had sleep endoscopy-directed surgery. And again, we reduced the apnea hypopnea index significantly, although never really cured the kids consistently. Now, the, one of the things that we really began doing more frequently based on these observations was lingual tonsillectomy and, uh, again, using nasotracheal intubations, the Jennings mouth gag, we retract the soft palate, extend the tongue using these rakes. We like having an assistant help and then use a 30 degree telescope and do it off the monitor. So this is a kid who's already had a tonsils out, uh, now back with severe sleep apnea, AHI is 9.3, O2 sat is 94. On the office fiber optic and laryngoscopy, you see huge amount of lingual tonsillar tissue. This is her lingual tonsillectomy. This was an early case using the uh, coblator. There was a lot of tissue to ablate. And uh, you see how we work our way in. And little by little ablate the, uh, the tissue <coughs> until we begin to see the epiglottis and explore that. And there it is. You can see it now. And as we've gotten better and more comfortable with the procedure, we've gotten more aggressive. This is her post-operatively in the office. You can see that entire tongue base has been cleaned out or to her sleep apnea as a result. Um, in looking at some of our early results with endoscopic lingual tonsillectomy, again, uh, the significant difference in terms of post-operative control of the uh, sleep apnea. But again, we don't tend to completely cure these kids. We need to be upfront about that. Uh, and one of the other results from our sleep uh, endoscopy was a novel cause of obstructive sleep apnea, which was an occult form of laryngomalacia. We saw this in older kids, often in kids with the handicaps. Um, no daytime strider like classic laryngomalacia, just snoring at night. Um, and uh, it emerged on some of the kids after they'd had their tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. And again, you saw this before, but this is what they all look like. The larynx is kind of compressed, anterior to posterior, and you have the, uh, uh, the arytenoids popping inward. Um, this has been recognized in other contexts, but nobody really until that paper pulled it all together as a specific uh, problem. And um, again, here we looked at uh, the 22 cases uh, pre and post superglottoplasty, and here we got really nice results with this procedure. Again, uh, never fully curing it, but really may, may going from uh, a severe to mild uh, category on overall. Some of the kids were completely cured. So, as we our work began to accumulate, uh, and here's another kid with big lingual tonsils, and we did a lingual tonsillectomy, and then they came back to the office, and this is what I saw, and I almost had a heart attack. And then I saw another one. And this was the office. Uh, and then here we go. Post up with the epiglottis fused up against the back of the tongue. And see, you having any trouble swallowing? No. Yeah, you're not coughing after eating? No. Um, so, so, hmm, that's interesting. So we began to think about. Um, uh, you know, maybe doing a little bit more than just lingual tonsillectomy. And interesting enough, this was about the time when the adults, guys were doing their robotic, uh, began doing their robotic surgery on the tongue base and sewing the epiglottis up. So I said, you know, I don't know how to use a robot, but I think I can do that endoscopically. So this is a child with a sleep endoscopy, typical case. <clears throat> so we're going through, he's had his tonsils and adenoids out. And we go in and what you see is uh, epiglottis once again plopped up against the posterior pharyngeal wall. The tongue base is retruded and pulled back. 
and uh, he's got a component of a called the ring of Malaysia on top of that, probably as a uh, secondary to the proximal obstruction at the level of the epiglottis. So because when you do a, a, tongue, a, a jaw thrust, you see it opens right up. There's no obstruction at all. And when you drop it, there it is. So on this cut, we went ahead and did a lingual tonsillectomy, and again, the, the coblator has gone better over the years. There's less of that burning. Um, now, what you'll see us do here is uh, <coughs> carefully remove the uh, lingual tonsillar tissue, uh, primarily in the central core, avoiding the lateral uh, tongue uh, as much as possible although trying to remove as much lymphoid tissue as possible because that's where the two arteries are and really it's very bad form to get into those because that's a bad, that's a tough problem. Anyway, once that's done then we can then access the midline of the tongue and do a uh, midline glossectomy and you can see the difference in the, uh, in the muscle as the epiglottis burns that but you create a trough. Once that trough is created then you can denude the epiglottis nicely. Uh, on its posterior lingual aspect, and then again endoscopically, sutures passed through the epiglottis. This is hard. It's not easy. <coughs> the younger the child, the easier it is. The uh, by the time these kids are 18, this becomes that larynx is really far away. But in the younger kids, it seems to work well. And then you bring it into the trough. And then just simply tie it down. And this is what it looks like in the office uh, three months later, fiber optic laryngoscopy office procedure. You see the epiglottis again up against the tongue base. The lingual tonsils are gone. You can actually see the suture uh, uh, left on the right side. So we've done a bunch of these over the years, well over 50 by now. And um, we've not seen a problem with aspiration. We just simply haven't seen it. And we've not seen problems with post-operative. <coughs> uh, what we've not seen is consistent cures in back here. I wish I could say it was, but uh, some kids do fabulous. Most do drop about, you drop your, their AHI, but you never get into the, that, that mild to normal category for the most part. But you make them better. So, in conclusion, I'll tell you what I started with. This has been my experience. Sleep apnea is a three-legged stool. You've got to have all three in place for you to make that diagnosis and for you to take the risk of taking that kid to the operating and doing something serious. And it's based on symptoms, anatomy, and uh, this polysomnogram. Don't go running to the OR with a polysomnogram alone. Be convinced that there's, another, there's some there to operate on. There's common patterns to pediatric sleep apnea. In the neonatal group, you've got laryngomalacia. You've got the syndromic kids and you've got Pierre Robin. In the milk of your kids, 80% of them are going to have tonsils and adenoids. You're all going to see them as residents and as uh, attendings. And then there's that tough group, that tough group of little kids with adult type sleep apnea that sometimes you can help, but sometimes not. Primary surgery in neonates is supraglottoplasty and mandibular distraction and the goal is avoiding tracheotomy. We now have more than one operation on our menu for obstructive sleep apnea to be tonsils and adenoids, including partial, total, or total with expansion. And then secondary options for when the kid has small tonsils and adenoids or has failed the tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy. Most important is sleep apnea, uh, sleep endoscopy. But there's a whole range of techniques now that are generally easy to do and readily available to you in terms of managing the, the problems that can be surgically managed. It's real and it needs to be dealt with, but not in every case. 
not every child who snores has to be operated on. Um, the equation is age, anatomy, and physiology. You want to see all three. Uh, you're going to fail some of the time if you don't follow those uh, that, uh, that uh, recommendation. <coughs> you're going to fail sometimes if you do. Um, anyway, you have a lot of options available to you. Um, what's the future? I think that that's uh, a real interesting question. Near term, no question about that. Hyperglossal uh, pacing is going to help, especially those severe kids with Down syndrome who've uh, got hypopharyngeal collapse. Um, long term, you know, frankly, I think better orthodontic and or orthognathic techniques are going to be the real problems. Ugly is in the bone, okay? I know this from my work in craniofacial fractures. You know, if you don't get the bone right, you don't get the face right. Ugly's in the bone. And that's where the real problems with the pediatric sleep apnea are. So, again, it's important to remember CPAP always works. Yeah. It's always terrible. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity to share this with you. It's been a work of love for a long time. And uh, I still like doing it, believe it or not. But uh, so, I smaller companies. Anyway, thank you. We have about 10 minutes. Uh, any questions? First of all, Kay, you, you've been in this business doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. Tell us what your thoughts are. Well, I, I think there's uh, there's been a, a big evolution in what we've been able to do because it, it used to be just tonsils on everyone, and and there were there was always that subset of patients who uh, seemed to still have persistent symptoms. We just shrugged our shoulders up. So I think that's that's been a big advancement. Your comments about the obesity and gaining weight after tonsillectomy, the, the study that I did, actually what it showed was the patients who gained weight after tonsillectomy were specifically the ones that were below weight. If you were already at normal uh, normal weight percentile, higher weight, you didn't really gain. I misread that. It was the low percentile weight kids who gained weight. But that is a controversial topic because... There have been other studies done by other people that suggested both things. There are some studies that showed a gain weight at home, and the other studies that showed a loss of weight. So right now, there's still kind of some controversy over <coughs> weight gain after tonsillectomy. It's not totally clear. But the, the study that I, that I did more just showed the, the patients who were underweight to gain the weight. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, the adults and kids that we operated in this street at their tonsil with me, they all lost weight the first two weeks because they couldn't eat. <laughs> but three months down the line, six months down the line, I would hear the snoring's returned because we didn't deal with the fat that was in the pharynx from the weight loss. And I think you, you addressed that. That narrow airway from the fat is the same as in adults. Isn't that true? <laughs> yeah, right. It's the same as in the adults. It's a wonderful talk, Peter. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. Yes, Stanley. You know, I feel like this is more of an access to care issue, um, I think, in that. So, you know, say on the pediatric end, uh, you, you know, you have these kids, let's say age um, of 15, 16, um, age high of, say, 10, very symptomatic. And so, let's say various procedures and, and interventions have been done for them. Then suddenly they show up in the adult uh, clinic. All right, and now suddenly that age, they're still symptomatic, but suddenly that age is no longer high enough for them to have continued care. So we have this young adult or, or adolescent to young adult population that are truly underserved simply because of the, the classification of the age and, 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 and how you know, they're classified in, in the pediatric and the adult population. And we, we struggle bridging, you know, like there are things we want to do for them, uh, but it's tough. It's, it's tough to get approval uh, to do things for them. Well, this is, I, I think your question and your comment on, underscores my point that sleep apnea is a, is a tripartite uh, problem with uh, not just uh, the polysomnogram, but the symptoms. If the kid is suffering, it needs you, you need the help. And, you know, then you, those are kids worth going to fight with the insurance companies for. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a tough fight they wouldn't deny, or say they had missed, uh, uh, you know, tonsillectomy and, and utricle beat. 
that's a that's a battle sometimes uh, in, in itself. Uh, we only have success if they actually have dental facial deformity, and, and so you could do skeletal surgery for them. They kind of you know we catch those, but otherwise it's a it's a horrible policy sort of thing with insurance companies. You know the way they. they so they I'm, use. I'm curious about something. This problem that you're observing is specifically when they pass 18 or right. some other age. 18. 18. Yeah. 18. Yeah. 18. Yeah. A quick question regarding that. Are there like validated uh, obstructive sleep apnea with specific quality of life measures? Right? Because I mean, just because somebody has an HI of 40 or somebody else has an HI of 40 doesn't mean that it has the same impact on their life, right? And we, the same thing when we do like sinus surgery and things, like we don't just treat what's on the CAT scan, right? We, we treat also. That, that is a <coughs> wonderful <coughs> comment uh, because. What we have, yes, we do have psychometric tools. There are sleep quality <coughs> questionnaires for sleep mm -hmm. more broadly, but there's zero correlation between patient symptoms and PSG data. So neurocognitive symptoms and PSG data as we do. So, yep, as Peter pointed out, uh, there is a bigger need for biomarkers of disease. Mm -hmm. And sleep apnea, sleep test is really not it. Uh, it is a really poor tool, as Peter commented uh, before. Mm -hmm. And on that tone, I wanted to congratulate you, and it's easy to see your passion into everything you do over there and everything you build. And I share your vision for the future that but we really, in the, in the kids in particular, how to study and foster craniofacial <coughs> growth. That is something that Stanley is looking quite a bit on the, in kids and adults, and how do you improve craniofacial growth. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to be quite the future in, in looking the route. Mm -hmm. well. Stanley, your your techniques. Uh, how how far can they be extended into the pediatric age group? Um, in terms of so uh, the only thing so you know neonates you could do you know the mandibular distractions you have shown. Other than that, until they have reached bony skeletal maturity, just, the only thing you can do is maxillary expansion, and, yeah. and which you've seen. The crozet. Um, and uh, and and so then from our end, they're they're. You know, I love the comments about expansion of because nothing improves nasal breathing, at least in, in our adult experience, better than that. Right. And, and get, you know, the tongue space. Right. And so we've stretched that out, that procedure out to age 62. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I, I actually think of among, among otolaryngologists who treat kids, I, I think the recognition of palatal expansion as a big option for obstructive apnea isn't really widespread. Mm -hmm. It's not something that's really commonly believed throughout all, all otolaryngologists. But, uh, you know, it probably more needs to be published about it mm -hmm. to, to get that common belief out. The orthodontist grab these kids while we're working on them. They see the high arch palate, they put the Crozat's appliance on, and then the patients don't need to see us anymore. It, 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 it's quite a surprise. To be yeah. honest, to see the question. how, despite the fact that there is a lot of measurable data, you yeah. know, the X rays or combing CTs, it is the wild west. Yeah. The, the <laughs> level of publications when it comes from this. So again, that that is another thing that on the adult side, a good job of kind of making this more. But on the pediatric side, it's literally the wild west. Mm -hmm. And what people published on techniques and everyone that comes with a new distractor or a new technique calls out, oh, this is the way to do it. So it is that it hinders a little bit. Um, what what would be translated? Yep. How many of you got the um, uh, flyer from Harvard's otolaryngology program uh, this week? Uh, uh, in it is an article by Chris Hartnick on uh, the current uh, somewhat foolish fashion of uh, doing tongue tie and lip tie release on newborn babies to quote help their breastfeeding, sleep apnea, and particularly tongue tie release recently on older kids to, for uh, uh, treating sleep apnea. Um, you'll see this uh, because there's been some enthusiasm uh, for this on the adult sleep medicine side. Mm -hmm. uh, think about it, guys. What's the frenulum do? We all have one. Kind of holds your tongue to the front, to the front right? right? So what happens when you cut it? Collapses back. Tongue kind of falls back. Yeah. That doesn't make sense in, in, the, in sleep apnea to me. Maybe others it does, but it just mechanically doesn't make sense to me. Perhaps Stanley, who 
has been having. <laughs> no, no, no. You've been having to deal with it because you've been closer to it. How have you dealt with it? Uh, you just well, kept your mouth shut. No. <laughs> no. Because I think a lot of this, I mean, none of this can be done in isolation or, or, or observe in, in, in isolation. You know, if, if, if an individual is truly tongue tied to the extent that it affects uh, craniofacial growth and whatnot, you know, or genioglossus muscle advancement, then, you know, it's something to consider. But that's far and few. That's like at the end, uh, the bell curve. And unfortunately, people are doing it for everybody else. Yeah, one size fits all. There's been an exponential growth in the number of uh, phrenectomies done on newborn babies. And if you uh, look at the rise in the number of um, lactation specialists in the country, it parallels the rise exactly. <laughs> anyway, with that, would you like to come in? So we did this uh, topic about the detail. Uh, we don't talk about we are doing some systematic review about that. And we find 14 patients with major complications, like uh, hypovolemia, uh, like uh, lumbin angina, and we are writing that, and we uh, realize that in most of the systematic review that do about breastfeeding and look for secondary outcomes, looks that uh, mention that like just the bleeding is like a minor complication, and there is not uh, any significant complication. But we have 14 patients that already have major complications, and maybe it suggests that uh, do a phrenostomy is not a good idea for a uh, patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll tell you, I think nothing is quite as satisfying to pediatric otolaryngologists as seeing a newborn baby who's truly tongue-tied, giving mom a misery, releasing that tongue-tie in the office, putting the baby to the mother's breast, leaving her alone for 10 minutes, and then coming back in and seeing the smile on That's her face. Nothing feels quite like That's that. True. Um, so when it's appropriate, it's great. Yep. It really is. But boy, it seems to be done an awful lot of times these days, but I'm not sure it's necessary. Anyway, with that, thank you for your attention. Tonight.